This reading review for the final exam in the spring 2019 section of English 1710, Introduction to Language and Technology, provides a broad overview of each reading, and by reviewing them together in one sitting, suggests the thread that links each reading to the next in much the same way binge watching a TV show gives viewers a different perspective than watching the same show week to week and year to year. While listening to this review, it is important that you do the cognitive work of thinking about how each reading connects to the primary topic of our class, language and technology. What do we mean by language? What do we mean by technology? How does language and technology relate to one another? And how do they influence one another? What does the interaction between language and technology do to us as communicators, individuals, and members of different forms of community? With those questions in mind, have your note-taking technology, a pen and paper or a computer, ready, and let's begin the review. We began the semester with Ted Chiang's The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling, which illustrates what we mean by the transition from an oral culture to a literate culture, and from a literate culture to a digital culture. In both cases, the story raises questions about what effect this shift in language use has on our understanding of truth and what we view as right and just. Victoria Fromkin's What is Language? defines language as the sound concept system that human beings use to communicate by sending, encoding, and receiving, decoding, sounds we produce. She tells us that language is the system of speech and mutual understanding of that speech by others who use that language. By knowing a language, quote, you have the capacity to produce sounds that signify certain meanings and to understand or interpret the sounds produced by others, unquote. Nicholas Wade's Early Voices, The Leap to Language, reveals the debates about the origin of language in our evolution, which involves natural selection, or survival, and sexual selection, or desired traits of mates. He discusses how humans evolve the physical and mental capabilities for language. Natural selection, survival, the need to communicate, and sexual selection, mate choice, desire traits, likely interacted to produce changes in the sounds we can make, the sounds we can perceive, and the brain architecture to acquire a language early in life. Stephen J. Klein's What is Technology? helps us break down exactly what we mean when we use the ubiquitous term technology. He gives us four usages. Usage one has to do with hardware or artifacts or tools, hammers, smartphones, and cars. Usage two has to do with socio-technical systems of manufacture, the systems and tools that make the technology that we use in usage one. Usage three has to do with what we know, knowledge, technique, know-how, and methodology. Usage four has to do with a socio-technical system of use, or a system that combines hardware, people, and other things to do the things that human beings cannot otherwise accomplish without these systems. These are extensions of ourselves. This is the cyborg. Salakoko Mufwene's Language as Technology, Some Questions that Evolutionary Linguistics Should Address, redefines language from a natural ability, think of Fromkin, to a technology broadly defined, a system used to get the work of communication done or to solve the problem of communication with an agreed-upon system of encoding and deciphering sound utterances. He argues that because language is a means to fulfill a purpose, and that means can be knowledge when used to explain or handle something else, practice when extended to the solution of a problem, or science, as in science and technology, when scientific knowledge is applied to develop practical things in order to make our lives easier or to help us solve problems, all of which are broad definitions for technology. Language is a technology or a means to fulfill a purpose namely of communication. 
Walter Ong's Writing as a Technology that Restructures Thought explores the issues raised in Ted Chiang's The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling. Namely, the literate mind is fundamentally different than the mind of one who has primary orality, or no knowledge of reading and writing. This is the difference between oral and literate cultures. Then, secondary orality is the return to oral culture through literacy with digital technologies. Much like the narrator's world in Chiang's story, moving from a literate to digital culture, which we would call a culture of secondary orality. Bruce Maslisch's The Fourth Discontinuity shows how humanity is continuous with this technology. If we consider Ong's argument that writing changes how we think, Maslisch would agree because he argues that we create technology that changes us, and we in turn change and improve upon technology. Human beings and their technology are part of a system, and that system has progressed to a point where some of our digital technology is in fact very much like us in terms of thought and decision making. In Jacques Derrida's Linguistics and Grammatology, Derrida uses a strategy of deconstruction to show how spoken language should not be privileged over writing. Deconstruction attempts to reveal how oppositions, such as speech and writing, mind and body, or presence and absence, which are usually presented in texts with one being more important than the other, are actually constructed by the text instead of being so independent of the text. In this case, Derrida identifies the binary relationship between speech and writing promoted throughout Western thought. Derrida explores the tension and contradictions between the binary of speech and writing and establishes how neither speech nor writing is primary. To accomplish this, he develops some important ideas. First, he uses the term archer writing, or archer écriture in French, to envelop all systems of representation, which includes language and writing. Second, he coins the homophone term difference, spelled D-I-F-F-E-R-A-N-C-E, to mean difference between words and the play-like indefinite deferment of meaning where one linguistic sign leads to another, to another, etc., making the meaning of words never fully present to us. Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto reveals how we are all cyborgs because our entire existence is mediated by digital technology and networks of global capital. These digital systems exert control over our lives and have an influence on how we communicate with spoken language and writing. She urges us to seize these tools of oppression for ourselves to create networks of affinity and mutual support. This would, in turn, give us more control over these technologies, coming back to Ong and Maslisch, that shape our minds and ourselves. In Catherine Hale's In Toward Embodied Virtuality, argues that unlike the cybernetic fantasists who embrace the liberal humanist idea of mind-body duality, and thus a discontinuity between information and materiality, materiality is necessary for information. For example, information relies on physical media for storage, and human bodies and brains are required to interface with information technology. Hales wants to, quote, put back into the picture the flesh that continues to be erased in contemporary discussions about cybernetic subjects, end quote. Marshall McLuhan teaches us in The Medium is the Message that technologies, including media technologies, are extensions of human beings. Focusing on media, these technologies have affordances and constraints as well as unintended consequences. They make certain patterns possible, and it is, it is these patterns that we should study. For example, if we consider Mufwene's argument that language is a technology, it creates boundaries of possibility, a pattern, for what can and cannot be expressed using language. 
While new media contain older media, for example, the smartphone includes the telephone, uh, the telegraph, television, radio, and more, the new media inaugurates a new culture. As a result of computers and new telecommunication technologies, he called this new culture the global village, meaning that with the increasing speed of transferring information between people in distant places, actually contracts the large world into something akin to a small village. He gave us some terms to help analyze media. A hot medium allows for less participation or interactivity than a cool one. Books are hot, while Twitter is cool. He uses the terms figure and ground. The ground is the medium. It is the background, an area that we don't usually pay attention to. Out of the ground, figures arise and become noticeable. These are older media contained within the new media and the content within those that we pay attention to. Finally, McLuhan gives us the media tetrad. We can ask these questions about media in order to critique them with the media tetrad. What does the medium enhance? What does the medium make obsolete? What does the medium retrieve that has been obsoleted? What does the medium flip into or reverse into when pushed to extremes? Consider Twitter as an example. It enhances communication for groups of people separated by distance and time. It makes phone calls, emails, and some kinds of file sharing, photos and videos, obsolete. It retrieves personal interaction and verbal communication. It reverses into bullying, dog whistles, piling on, bots, Gamergate, confusion, those who tweet more often can control the conversation. Following a conversation of many participants can be time-consuming and inefficient. Indecision. The feed never ends. There's always one more tweet. Misunderstanding. The low bandwidth of communication leads to misunderstanding intent, emotional content, etc. And fabrication. Our reliance on the medium without the necessary critical awareness or time to evaluate sources leads to the proliferation and acceptance of fake news and hoaxes without awareness. Friedrich Kittler teaches us in Gramophone Film Typewriter that all media have always been an important and integral part of discourse. Like McLuhan, he observes that, quote, the content of each medium is another medium, end quote. Our media within media should be considered equally when studying discourse, not only as discourse's record, but also because they, quote, determine our situation, end quote. They determine our situation because they define what and how discourse is recorded. We study this via discourse networks, or in Kittler's words, quote, the network of technologies and institutions that allow a given culture to select, store, and process relevant data, end quote. However, his concern, unlike that of McLuhan, is that technologies of writing and communication are not necessary, not necessarily liberating extensions of ourselves, but instead, through the logic of what he calls escalation, they take preeminence over humanity and individual human agency. Charles Kostelnik demonstrates in his essay, The Typographical Design, Modernist Aesthetics, and Professional Communication, how important the Bauhaus was to modern design, and he gives us four ways to use Bauhaus design in technical documents. 1. Integrate visual and verbal language to achieve the purpose of the document. Maximize the interaction between word and image. Two. Consider strict economy to be as much an aesthetic and rhetorical as a functional criterion. 3. Use visual language that the audience is accustomed to, but adapt this language to the context of the document. And 4. Combine intuitive and rational problem solving during the writing design process. Because professional communicators create documents for specific audiences and situations, they need to evaluate rationally 
the visual processing task of users. J. David Bolter and Richard A. Grusin argue in their essay titled Remediation that all media tend to operate between two poles, immediacy, or the erasure of the medium, or less apparent, or transparency, and hypermediacy, or promotion of the medium, or more apparent, or opaque, or multiply, or escalate. Immediacy and hypermediacy draw attention to the borrowing and repurposing that new media do of old media. This is called remediation. Remediation is what new technologies do, quote, define itself in relationship to earlier technologies of representation, end quote. The new media borrow from and refashion old media such as painting, photography, radio, television, and film. It can also include technologies underlying the media such as the vacuum tubes and radios were repurposed to make television possible. Their principle is that, quote, all mediation is remediation, end quote. All media exist in relation to other media. Remediation works in both directions. Quote, this attempt shows that remediation operates in both directions. Users of older media, such as film and television, can seek to appropriate and refashion digital graphics, just as digital graphics artists seek to refashion film and television, end quote. Lisa Geidelman's Always Already New brings the social and historical to our understanding of media. She defines media as, quote, socially realized structures of communication, where structures include both technological forms and their associated protocols, and where communication is a cultural practice, a ritualized co-location of different people on the same mental map, sharing or engaged with popular ontologies of representation. As such, media are unique and complicated historical subjects. Their histories must be social and cultural, not the stories of how one technology leads to another or of isolated geniuses working their magic in the world, end quote. We need to focus on the complexity of the social and historical effects by and to media in order to understand them. We learn the social and historical background of an earlier technology of communication and community building in Fred Turner's Where the Counterculture Met the New Economy, the Well, and the Origins of Virtual Community. With this essay, we discussed Ken Kesey's Merry Pranksters, The Further Bus and LSD, Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog, Remember, Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish, the first public computer bulletin board system known as Community Memory at Leopold's Records in Berkeley, California, and The Well, W-E-L-L, -L, or The Whole Earth Electronic Link, which was co-founded by Stuart Brand and Larry Brilliant. The Well began as a dial-in bulletin board system, or BBS, and later transitioned to an internet-based online community. The effect of this online community on the people and culture of Silicon Valley and by extension to all of us who use the, their technologies, cannot be understated. Lev Manovich's What is New Media, from his book The Language of New Media, defines new media for us. Manovich argues that the history of the image and the history of computing have converged in the present with, quote, the translation of all existing media into numerical data accessible for computers, end quote and the result being new media, which he defines as, quote, graphics, moving images, sounds, shapes, spaces, and text, which become computable. That is simply another set of computer data, end quote. Later, he adds, quote, in short, media becomes new media, end quote. Also, he gives us a set of five principles of new media. The first two are the foundation, and the later three depend on the first two. They are one, numerical representation, or new media objects are represented as numerical data that can be formally or mathematically described and manipulated with computer algorithms. Two, modularity, 
or the fractal, fractal structure of new media, or how new media objects can be combined or disassembled out of many reusable and interchangeable parts. Three, automation, or the way in which computer templates and code can automate creation and manipulation of new media. Four, variability, or being not being fixed and potential to be inf in infinitely many different versions. Five, transcoding, or the translation of the two layers, the computer layer and the cultural layer. Written 10 years after Manovich's The Language of New Media, Alexander R. Galloway revisits this groundbreaking work with What is New Media? 10 Years After the Language of New Media. Galloway argues that Manovich's The Language of New Media is a product of the beginning of the widespread adoption of the Internet in the late 1990s. This is the Web 1.0 era, as opposed to the next stage of Internet technology evolution called Web 2.0. He explains how Manovich's five principles, numeric representation, modularity, automation, variability, and transcoding, are aesthetic properties of the data underlying the representations made possible by that data. For example, we can say that a digital photo is aesthetic, good form, exposure, interesting subject, etc. Likewise, the digital data that the photo is comprised of is aesthetic, According to Manovich's five principles, there is a beauty to the data, its manipulation, its effect on culture, etc. Galloway targets Manovich's book's greatest weaknesses, cinema and history. In the case of cinema, Manovich argues that it is the first new media even though it predates the personal computer by a hundred years. Manovich's view of the immobile cinematic frame as, quote, the default condition of the human computer interface, end quote, seems too narrow, rings false, if we compare the cinematic experience with personal computer experience. Galloway's last complaint about Manovich's approach is the layer metaphor that he uses at the end of the book. The appearance layer of new media is cinema, the material layer is its digital technology, and the logic layer is algorithmic. Galloway calls this a misen abim, kind of like a matroshka doll, one thing contains another, contains another. More formally, a misen abin is a form of recursion. A copy of an image is embedded within itself, implying infinite recursion. In their introduction to the Online Lives 2.0 issue of the journal Biography, Laurie McNeil and John David Zuern respond to Sidoni Smith's question, quote, Multitasking, search trails, network sociality are all effects of human-machine ensemble exchanges that structure everyday life in developed and developing countries. To what extent do these phenomena affect the organization of consciousness? End quote. We know from our reading of Ong, Maslisch, and McLuhan that these technologies change us as we continue to change them according to Kittler's logic of escalation. They draw distinctions between Web 1.0, meaning passive, readable, static, universal, individual, curated, server, centralized, portal, one-way, more control, and Web 2.0, meaning active, writable, dynamic, tailored, social, social knowledge, cloud, dispersed, search two-way, interactive, and less control. During the Web 1.0 era, one conceivably could create an online identity distinct from one's in-real-life identity. But they argue that Web 2.0 is blurring, quote, the boundaries between online and off offline life, and as a consequence, boundaries between private and public life, end quote. A large part of this loss of control has to do with the shift from one-to-many Web 1.0 to many-to-many -many Web 2.0 and the latter's virtue placed on sharing. In Anil Dash's The Lost Infrastructure of Social Media, 
He laments the consolidation of online communication media over the last decade. He focuses on technologies including publishing, creating and making content available online, search, search engines trawling content and search built into the platforms, comments, written interaction and response to content on the same platform, responses, track responses to content, like or favorites, the social signal of approval of content, updates, lets others know when you publish new content, identity, persistent identity across platforms, friend lists, a way of tracking who you follow and who follows you, following, keep up to date on the writing of others, syndication, subscribe to content, APIs, or application programming interfaces, to build tools and apps that use or interact with other platforms or services, metadata, user-generated content about content, or layers of data, discovery and tagging, helping others find new or related content, analytics, traffic, engagement, and user profiles, advertising, ad networks, aggregation, including tools like RSS, and time shifting and reading, saving web pages to read offline or later. The key takeaway is that so-called innovations in current online communication and social technologies are not necessarily new. It's just that the field of options has contracted for a variety of reasons including profitability, planned obsolescence, corporate acquisitions, etc. We can learn from the past to imagine better ways to use technologies today. In When Technology Became Language, The Origins of the Linguistic Conception of Computer Programming, 1950-1960, David Nofrey, Mark Priestley, and Gerald Alberts chart how the term language began to be used metaphorically to describe how humans program computers to do work. They argue that with the industrial production of different kinds of computing systems, programmers work to bridge computing compatibility or programming compatibility across platforms through computer languages that could be compiled into appropriate executables for a given platform. This higher form of programming, as opposed to lower level machine code, adapted linguistic forms to incorporate the formal logic of computer programming. It's important to remember, though, that these computer languages are not as robust as spoken or written languages used for communication. Nevertheless, these authors explain that the use of language has had an impact on the development of computer hardware and software through programming language use as a machine-independent activity. And we can also think about its impact on our al own algorithmic thinking widely promoted in tools like If This Then That and Coding Camps. Marie Hicks argues in her book Programmed Inequality, How Britain Discarded Women Technologists and Lost Its Edge in Computing, that women who had roles throughout the nascent British computing industry were systematically sidelined, pushed out, and excluded from the industry as it matured. As a result, Britain lost its early worldwide lead in computing technology. More importantly, Hicks tells us that, quote, the British case shows how new technologies often help certain classes consolidate power while stripping power from others, end quote. This is, of course, a big problem, a question this raises for us in thinking about Maslisch and considering the gender gap in Silicon Valley, the engine of computing technology and services today. What kind of effect does a technology designed primarily by men have on everyone? What gets put in and what gets left out when the team developing a technology is so skewed to one end of the gender spectrum? Could these effects lead to specific shifts in language use in new technology development? Finally, we arrive at the last two readings uh, in the class, which you may earn extra credit on in the final exam by summarizing. Our penultimate, or next to last, reading was Jacques Derrida's Signature Event Context. In this reading, he takes issue with the philosopher of thought and language, J. L. Austin. 
and his theory of speech acts, specifically the idea of locution, what's said, illocution, what's meant, and perlocution, what happens or results. Austin argues that understanding of a message is accessible via context. However, Derrida argues, focusing on communication in terms of writing, that context, one, writing exists in the absence of the author, two, context does not constrain the meaning of writing, and three, absence implied by the speaking the, by the spacing between words invites the rupture of meaning. These points that Derrida argues are founded on the idea that signs are defined by absence or what they are not, and signs are iterative or repeatable, forming meaning assembled with other iterated signs. Signatures, the basis for written authenticity, can be forged and are themselves not representative of who we are after they are made. Context, the supposed way of understanding communication, is absent original context, absent a universal con context, and is in fact a construct created by each reader based on their experience and subjectivity. The bottom line for us is that communicators cannot assume readers will derive the implied meaning from presumed context. Finally, we arrive at the last reading in class, William Hart Davidson's On Writing, Technical Communication, and Information Technology, The Core Competencies of Technical Communication. Here, Hart Davidson bridges Derrida's ideas from signature event context into technical communication discourse in response to the rise of desktop publishing in the technical communication field. He observes that computers have eroded the perception of expertise wielded by the technical communicator. Drawing on Derrida's concepts of the sign as infinitely iterable and interpreted, he argues first that while computers erase the traditional aspect of the technical communicator's identity, as a writer, the technical communicator can use computer technology to develop and maintain a slippery identity, or one that iterates in response to the needs of the job and the tools at hand. Second, he calls for flexible strategies that, like hypertext, use the contextual linkages of signs to make meaning. Likewise, technical communicators can use these flexible strategies to reveal their added value in the workplace. This in turn leads to his conclusion in which the kinds of symbolic manipulation and analytical work performed by technical communicators opens up larger avenues for advancement in information technology development. It's been a pleasure teaching you all this semester. I hope that you carry these ideas forward and make use of them in your other classes and beyond City Tech in the workplace. Also, I want to encourage you all to read all that you can over the summer. Of course, some of that reading should be for enjoyment alone, but some of it should also be simply for the pleasure of finding things out. Use reading to feed your curiosity about things. Some of your curiosity should be about your major and career path, but some of it can be about other things that equally interest you. As I've said in class, if you set yourself the goal of being a lifelong learner, you'll be setting yourself up for self-sustaining success. By learning and expanding your knowledge and skill set, you are preparing yourself for better opportunities that may come along and others that you create yourself. And do things with what you've learned. Create a blog, share your knowledge on social media, enter writing contests, and connect with others interested in these same things. Good luck.